Well, good morning to all of you. Bellingham Bible Baptist Church. I believe it's been at least a couple of years since my wife and I have uh, been back, but I am so glad your preacher gave us this opportunity uh, to come back and to preach on Bible prophecy. Amen. The soon return of Jesus Christ for his bride in the event that we call the rapture of the church. Amen. But we are in the holiday season and we are surrounded by lights. Amen. And so when you think of this time of the year, when you think of lights, of course you think of Christmas, but you also think of Hanukkah. Hanukkah goes by two different names. It's known as the Festival of Lights, but it is also called the Feast of the Dedication. And we're gonna get into just a very brief, brief history of how this holiday originated. Think about this with me for a moment. Whenever something bad happens to the Jews, they make a holiday out of it, right? I'm just, just saying, uh, you know, and one of them would be Hanukkah. The other one would be Purim, P-U-R-I-M, Purim, which is recorded in the book of Esther since Haman tried to hang every Jew on the gallows in Persia. Of course, that all backfired on him. The Jews won, and they made a holiday out of it, and that's called the holiday or the festival of Purim. But we're going to be talking about Hanukkah this morning. So before we get into that, we do have our book table um, set up over here. And I'm excited because I just wrote a brand new book. This is my eighth book, a brand new book called When Will This Generation End? And there's been a lot of miscommunication, misconceptions concerning the word generation. Is it 80 years? Is it 70 years? Is it 50 years? Is it 40 years? Is it even a time period at all? So I look at it from not only a biblical perspective, but a prophetic perspective as well. So this book runs about 143 pages, and it's fresh right off the press. We've got a shipment coming in, but you can pre-order this book along with other books that we have there on the table, Israeli neckties and things of that sort. <clears throat> the pickings are a little bit slim, but please visit the table and uh, check out what we have there. You can also sign for our free email newsletters. They go out every single week. So give us your name, your email address, and please print clearly so that we can get you into the database. But please pre-order this book. When will this generation end? Could this even be the generation? Could this even be the final generation? So uh, hopefully you will be able to order uh, this book. And preacher, I appreciate you giving me this opportunity to come and to preach uh, here at Bellingham Bible Baptist Church. Whenever I come in, I'm preaching up the street at First Baptist Church. I'm, I'm sure you met Brother Baron Rodericks. Uh, and he has me coming at least two times uh, a year. And, of course, here at Bellingham Bible Baptist Church. So it's a blessing to be here uh, with all of you. Uh, we're living in some really trying times right now, are we not? Uh, you know, the Bible says we're living in perilous times, right? Uh, that's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And when you read verses 1 through 5 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, you will notice 19. I've counted and recounted. 19 characteristics of the last days that you and I are right now witnessing prior to Jesus' soon return that we call the rapture of the church. You know, Paul said this, know also that in the last days. We're in the last days, right? In the last days, perilous times shall come. And then he gives us all these characteristics of the last days. He says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Do we not see that going on right now? Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, what are we to do? That's what the Bible says, right? To turn away. And so these are the 19 characteristics of the last days. The last days that began with the birth of Jesus Christ, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and will end at the next main event we call the rapture of the church. So the rapture of the church will put an end to 2,000 years of church age history from Pentecost up until now. And so when the Christians are taken out of here at the rapture, then a world leader will come on the stage, the global stage, and he will confirm Daniel 9.27 a... Seven year peace treaty with the nation of Israel. And when that has been confirmed in Daniel 9 27, 
then the end times will commence. We're not in the end times now, we're in the last days. The end times will happen sometime after the rapture that will cover the tribulation period, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the 1,000 year millennial kingdom reign, but stops at the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20, 11 through 15. That's the reason why, folks, in these last days in which we live, we need to be astute students of Bible and Bible prophecy, amen? Why? There's just so much junk out there. There's just so much false doctrine out there. There's so much heresy out there. And unfortunately, a lot of this junk has entered into the church. That's why we need to be in the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. I stand alone on the KJV, the B-I-B-L-E, amen? We need to have our nose in this book every single day. Do not get your doctrine from the world. Don't get your doctrine from Hollywood. Don't get your doctrine from little mini-series like The Chosen. Oy vey. Don't get your doctrine. Get your doctrine from this book. Get your doctrine when the man of God gets up here and he preaches the word of God. You take all that in, amen? And then when you go home, you study. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The only way, preacher, we can rightly divide the word of truth is if we study. That's a filthy word in the church today. We need to study. You got the cults that are running rampant out there, false doctrine that's, per, uh, that's been uh, penetrating the church, Christians falling for every single form of heresy that's out there. Even got to watch out for Christian TV. You can throw that in there as well. I simply just don't watch Christian TV anymore. There's just so much heresy that's on there today. And when it comes to Bible prophecy, it is one of the most abused doctrines in the church today. I did a TV uh, interview for Land and Lion Ministries in uh, Dallas, Texas, and uh, one of the guys, well, actually, Dr. Dave Reagan said to me, he said, August, he said, one of the most abused doctrines in the world today is Bible prophecy. It's abused, it's misused, leading to people becoming confused. That shouldn't be the case. You should not be confused when it comes to the plain sense teaching of Bible prophecy. And when I preach at churches all across America, I make this very clear. When I teach Bible prophecy, I want to teach it responsibly. Amen. Not irresponsibly, responsibly. And the only way that I can teach it responsibly is if I allow the scriptures to interpret the scriptures. That's simple, right? That's a good rule of thumb right there. They call that hermeneutics, the science of biblical interpretation. Who's speaking? Who's he speaking to? What is he speaking about? We must allow scripture to interpret scripture. We look at it for its grammatical, historical, contextual, and very important, literal interpretation. And if you run into symbols in the Bible, you're not going to interpret those symbols on your own. The Bible will interpret those symbols for you. Whenever you run into symbols, you always look for a literal interpretation behind the symbolism. You apply that rule of biblical thumb, you will avoid all the nonsense that's being propagated out there today. So what I want to do briefly this morning, because I think we might be belly shipping in a little bit, right? Is that true? You know, I like the fellowship, but I like the belly ship too. I think we're going to be doing some belly shipping in a little bit. But what I want to talk about is Hanukkah. I know you got a TV screen here, and I forgot we have one right down here so I can see what I'm going to be clicking on here. Hanukkah and the light of the world. So with that said, let's go to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. Daniel chapter number 11. And uh, I'm going to have to get used to this clicker right here, but it seems to be self-explanatory. Left, right, and I believe that's a laser right there. I'm good. <laughs> All right. Daniel, Daniel chapter number 11. I got to say... Daniel chapter, I, I'm yet to hear someone preach on Daniel chapter number 11. It's a very long, long chapter, but there's a lot of history, a lot of history that is going on here. As a matter of fact, when you read Daniel 11 uh, verses 2 through 35, you are reading 200 years of war, 200 years of war between two Faction shortly after Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided among his four main generals, 
to stick out like a sore thumb. The Seleucid faction and the Ptolemies. The Seleucids were in Syria, the Ptolemies were in Egypt, and they are just, they're, 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 just, they're duking it out, man. They are duking it out because they want a piece of the whole pie, but somebody's caught right in the middle of this crossfire. Look at Daniel chapter two, uh, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 11, and uh, let's look at verse number 28. We'll read verses 28 through 32. Daniel chapter 11, 28 through 32. And the word of God says this. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. That would be the Mosaic covenant. And he shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Cheatham shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against, there it is again, the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. An arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary. That would be the temple of strength. And he shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. Verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant, again, the holy covenant, shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly gracious Father, Thank you again, Lord, for the blessing of being here in your house on this Lord's day to worship you, magnify, and glorify your holy and righteous name. Lord, when we think of this time of the year with Christmas, Hanukkah, we think of all these lights that surround us. And it reminds us that Jesus Christ called himself the light of the world. But he also called us in Matthew 5, 16 to be lights as well. In a world full of darkness, a world full of pain, suffering, wrecked by the Adamic covenant, the Adamic nature, that sinful nature, Lord. And it's getting darker out there every single day. But we know, Lord, that the darker it's getting in the world, the brighter it's becoming for the born-again believer. Jesus Christ is coming back. And we will one day hear that shofar. We will one day hear the sound of that trumpet. And he will call his bride, the living in Christ and the dead in Christ, to meet him in the air, to take us to the Father's house. That could even be today, Lord. But until then, help us to be that light. Help us to preach the gospel. Help us to share the good news with Jew and Gentile that Jesus Christ is coming again. Thank you, Father, for what you're about to do now. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said... As I said, folks, if you're going to study the book of Daniel, I would encourage you. I have a book over here that I wrote called Daniel Chronology. I think that would help you. If you're going to read the book of Daniel, may I say, read it chronologically. Don't read it numerically. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Don't read it straight through chapters 1 through 12. I get emails and texts and phone calls even from preachers around the country you know, my brother was out, I was just reading Daniel chapter 5, and it talks about the death of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. But man, when I get to Daniel chapter 7, it talks about the reign of Belshazzar. Well, I know there are no contradictions in scriptures, but what's up with that? How can a dead king reign? The problem is, you're not reading it chronologically. That simply means you have to jump around the book of Daniel. So if you're going to read it, read it in this chronological order. Chapters 1 through 4, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, then you're going to have to fast forward. Chapters 7 and 8. Then you're going to have to rewind. Chapters 5 and 6. Then you're going to have to fast forward again. Chapters 9, 10, 11, 12. So chronologically, that is how you should be reading the book of Daniel. Chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 5, 6, 9, 10, 11, 12. And you'll see how everything falls right into place. You say, well, why would God do that? He wants us to study. 
to show thyself approved unto God, a work that he is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that book would help you out right there. Daniel, a chronology, also serves as a commentary on the 12 chapters here in the book of Daniel. But as I said, Daniel chapter 11 deals with 200 years of war between these two factions, vying for power shortly after the death of Alexander the Great. The war between the Ptolemies, who were in Syria at this time, and, uh, excuse me, in Egypt at the time, and the Seleucids, who were in Syria. Here's what I love about the book of Daniel. Daniel wrote this in the 6th century B.C. 6th century B.C. And a lot of those prophecies were fill, fulfilled between the 4th and the 2nd century B.C. That's why critics hate the book of Daniel. Oh, someone other than Daniel had to write it between the 4th and 2nd century B.C. Baloney. Danny, uh, Danny, Daniel was in Babylon in the 6th century B.C. He wrote these prophecies, and many of them were fulfilled between the 4th and the 2nd century B.C. And by the way, you have prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled in the not-too-distant future, like Daniel chapter 2, like Daniel chapter 7, like Daniel chapter number 12. All are still future. Daniel talks about the Antichrist. He talks about the revival of the Roman Empire. He talks about the beast. He talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation period back to this earth. Now, I'm reminded, <laughs> I'm reminded of the old song from the 70s. Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right, here I am stuck in the middle with you. What this was, <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about, for you that have been around for a while. Here you have two warring factions, one in Syria, the Seleucids, one in Egypt, the Ptolemies, two of Alexander's generals vying for the whole kit and caboodle. Who's stuck in between? Israel. Israel is sandwiched between Syria and Egypt, even as it is today. And so the Jewish people are stuck in the cross. Fire. So just to give you an idea here, so you're looking at the map there, you can see, uh, if you can barely see there, Israel's like chicken scratch on this map, no bigger than the state of New Jersey. Uh, to the right there, you would see the Seleucid Empire in the purple. Uh, to the left would be the Ptolemaic Empire that were in Egypt. And right in between would be the Jewish people. Well, we know that the Seleucids defeated the Ptolemies. And so now this one individual who is a nut, he's a maniac, he's absolutely crazy, now he puts a bullseye on the forehead, ladies and gentlemen, of the Jewish people. This is one wicked, evil ruler. And he's mentioned right there in Daniel eleven twenty one as a vile person. It says right there, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So he is known as a vile person. I was preaching for Brother Doug Connolly at a First Baptist Church, and uh, we did a prophecy Q&A on Saturday. And uh, the place was packed, with a lot of pastors in the audience, and um, one guy gets up and he says, hey, Brother Rosado, I got a question. I'm like, yeah. He says, I was reading Daniel eleven twenty one. I said, okay. He says, uh, he says and I, I know exactly who that is. I said, well, so do I. <laughs> he says, oh, you do? I'm like, yes, I do. He goes, oh, kids, we're on the same page. But I knew we were on the same page. And uh, I said, well, who, who do you think it is? He goes, well, if you read Daniel eleven twenty, he's a raiser of taxes. And in verse 21, he's a vile person. I said, okay. He said, August, it has to be none other than Joe Biden. <laughs> come again? You should have saw the face on Brother Doug, man. I, his jaw just hit the floor, man. I'm like, come again? He said, well, that's got to be Joe Biden. Look at it, Brother August. He's raising our taxes. <laughs> and he's a vile individual. That's got to be him. I'm like, sir, I might not agree with the Biden administration, but your theology is whack. This is not Joe Biden. Why do you think the Jewish people celebrate Hanukkah? Now he's looking at me like a deer in the headlights. 
They celebrate Hanukkah because of what this vile person did to the Jewish people shortly after the war with the Ptolemies ended. He put a bullseye on the forehead of the Jewish people, and now this guy wants to outlaw Judaism all together. So he's called a vile person here in Daniel 11, 21, but in Daniel 8, 9, he's also called the little horn. The little horn, who would be a forerunner to the future little horn of Daniel chapter 7, verse number 8. That would be the beast, that would be the Antichrist, the ruler from the revived Roman Empire. So folks, this is what I mean when it comes to abuse of Bible prophecy. If you don't study it for its plain sense interpretation, you're going to get into all types of doctrinal trouble, amen? If the plain sense makes sense, don't look for any other sense, or you will end up with nonsense. nonsense. And I'll tell you, you I, Brother Doug's face, you should have saw his face. It was absolutely priceless. And my jaw hit the ground, too. Joe, buddy, give me a break, amen. We're going all the way back, ladies and gentlemen, to 167 B.C. Don't think Biden was around at that time. 167 B.C., when all these things were coming about. The man that I am talk of, talking about is this man right here, known as Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He's the vile person in Daniel 11, 21. The little horn in Daniel chapter 8 and verse number 9. This guy was a Greek who came over after Alexander's death and he wanted to rule the whole entire empire at the time, including the land of the Jewish people that the Bible describes in Daniel eleven sixteen 16 and Daniel eleven forty one 41 as the glorious land, the holy land, the land of milk and honey. But the Jews had a nickname for him. They called him Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the Madman. And he was, folks. I mean, he was on the same level as Herod the Great, if you will. He outlawed Judaism in the Holy Land. He prohibited Jews worshiping in the temple in Jerusalem. He forbade the circumcision of male babies at eight days old. It was illegal for Jews to read the Torah, the five books of Moses. He just outlawed Judaism altogether. But to add injury to insult, this guy was forcing Jews to sacrifice pigs. Not only sacrificing pigs, but even forcing them to eat pig flesh. I mean, this was absolutely unbelievable. But even with that, he did the unimaginable. What did he do? He went into the temple in Jerusalem with a pig. He went into the most holy place. I know they call it, call it Holy of Holies. I don't find that phrase in my King James Bible. So I say the most holy place. He goes into the most holy place with a pig, putting it on the altar, takes out a knife, plunges it into the belly of the pig, opens the pig up, takes his entrails, throws it everywhere in the temple. Then he erects a pagan altar, and then he builds a statue honoring the Greek god Zeus. But when he sacrificed that pig in the temple, the Jews took this mentality from Popeye. That's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. What did they do? Well, the Bible tells us what happened here. Look again with me in verse number 31. Look what Antiochus did in verse 31. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. That's something the Antichrist is going to do in the future. You know that, right? With a third rebuilt Jewish temple. He will put an end to animal sacrifices. And instead of bringing a pig in there like Antiochus did, he himself will be the abomination. He himself will defile that rebuilt third Jewish temple. But look at what the Jews do in verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people, the Jews that do know that God shall be strong and do what? Exploit 
they will take up arms. They will fight against Antiochus and the Seleucid Empire. This was a straw, ladies and gentlemen, that broke the camel's back for the Jewish people, and they waged guerrilla warfare against Antiochus and the Seleucid Empire. This guy not only hated God, this guy hated the Holy Covenant. Again, looking at Daniel 11, 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Notice the Hebrew on the bottom right there. You read Hebrew right to left. Berit Kadosha, the Holy Covenant. He hates the Holy Covenant. In verse 28, he's against the Holy Covenant. In verse 30, he's against the Holy Covenant. In verse 32, he is against the Holy Covenant. And now the Jewish people will take up arms and they will fight against this individual. Now, there was a sect about maybe 30 minutes from Jerusalem in a place called Modin. If you go on my YouTube channel, Dr. August Rosado, I teach from biblical Modin where this sect rose up and fought against Antiochus Epiphanes. We're talking about the priestly Jewish sect known as the Maccabees. The Maccabees. They gathered an army. They conducted guerrilla warfare against Antiochus, and that war raged for three years. One man got up by the name of Mattathias. Mattathias uh, waged this war. Unfortunately, he was killed in battle. His son Judah Maccabees took up the mantle and continued that war. He was known as Judah the Hammer. After three years, they defeated Antiochus. They drove them out of the Holy Land. But when they got into the temple, boy, they pig flesh everywhere. Ooh. There's a statue to Zeus. Look at this altar. What did they do? They destroyed that statue. They destroyed the altar. They cleansed the temple of all that pig flesh. And what did they do? They rededicated Hanukkah. They rededicated the temple back to God. Now, according to Jewish tradition, they found one day supply of oil in that temple. And that one day supply of oil burned miraculously for, how many branches do you see on here? Don't count this one. That one day supply of oil burned for eight days. Thus we have the miracle of Hanukkah. You're looking at a website here from the United with Israel reported the names of the heroes of the Hanukkah holiday. The Maccabees or the Maccabeem has been adopted by a number of important institutions, products, and places in the modern state of Israel. The heroes of the Hanukkah holiday who fought against the Greeks and Antiochus Epiphanes and won their independence from them 2,300 years ago and have been frequently referenced throughout the history of the Jewish state. Israel has the second largest health care provider. You know what they call it? Maccabees. In order of the Maccabees who defeated Antiochus Epiphanes 2,300 years ago. There's a place in Modin, in Israel, halfway between uh, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, called Modin Maccabee, where the Maccabees were born. Israel has a professional basketball team. You know what they call them? Tel Aviv Maccabee, in honor of these priestly Jews who fought against Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Judah Maccabee led that Jewish army and defeated the Seleucid Empire, regained control of the Jewish temple, cleansed it from the pig flesh and all the paganism that was in there, and they rededicated it back to God. This is why the Hanukkah comes into play here. This is almost similar to a menorah. A menorah has seven branches. And it's recorded in Exodus chapter number 25. This Hanukkah has eight branches with a top branch. The top branch is known in Hebrew as Shamas. Shamas in Hebrew, it's going to be kind of bright. If it's too bright, you let me know, okay? Shamas in Hebrew is servant. It's that top branch 
that gives light to all the other branches. Jesus said in John 8, 12, well, he would probably would have said it in Hebrew. He says, Ani or ha'olam. I am the light of the world. It's that same light who came to be a servant, right? For the Son of Man came not um, to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Now, this is the fourth night of Hanukkah. Tonight is the fourth night of Hanukkah. I have this in my window, but I wanted to bring it here with you. So it's that branch that lights all the other ones. I couldn't use candles, of course. So you take the candle, and you will light all the other branches. So this is the fourth night of Hanukkah. One day supply of oil, if it's too bright, just let me know, I'll shut it off. One day supply of oil burned miraculously, ladies and gentlemen, for eight days in the Jewish temple. They call that a miracle. Hey, do you know who celebrated Hanukkah in the Bible? Let's see who celebrated Hanukkah in the Bible. Notice John chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. And it was at Jerusalem, the what? The Feast of the Dedication. I told you, Hanukkah goes by two names, right? Festival of Light or Feast of the Dedication. And when you continue to read on, and it was where? Winter. It corresponds to Christmas. And it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Jesus was there at winter in Jerusalem to celebrate the Festival of Lights, the Feast of the Dedication, as the Maccabees rededicated the temple back to God after their victory over Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes and the Seleucid Empire. So if you were outside of Israel right now, we're not there, we're here in America. So since we are in America, you would refer to this holiday in Hebrew, Nes Gadol Haya Sham. A great miracle happened there, there in the Holy Land, 2,300 years ago. But if you were in the land of Israel, you would not say Neskado Haya Sham, you would say Neskado Haya Po. A great miracle happened here, here in the land of milk and honey, here in the land of promise, the land of prophecy in the future, the land of primacy. Notice the dreidel there. I was going to bring my dreidel with me, but I didn't have the time. We're about as late as it is. Notice the dreidel. Why does the dreidel come into play here? Remember, you used to listen to Zola Levin sing the song all the time. Dreidel, 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 I made it out of clay. And when it's dried and ready, oh, dreidel, will I play? <laughs> the dreidel. Why the dreidel? This little spinning top there. Well, if you go back to the Hanukkah story, because Antiochus outlawed Judaism. They could have read Bible. They could have studied the Torah. They could have worshiped in the temple. They could have do nothing. So they had to secretly study God's word. So as they're in their home and they're studying, they're studying, all of a sudden they hear troops coming. Oh, the Seleucids. They would take the scroll, tie it up. They would hide it. They would take a little spin and talk, spin it around. They'd come in. What are you Jews doing? Oh, nothing. We're just playing a little game, spitting that top here. Is that all? You studying Torah? You worshiping God? No, 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 no. We're just, we're just playing a game. All right, then. You better watch your P's and Q's. They'd go off, and then when they're done, they put the top away and come out with them. That's why we have the dreidel. The dreidel that has the Hebrew letters on it. Sheen, Noon, Gimel, Hey, Neskada Hayasham, a great miracle happened there. That's why they spin the dreidel. That's why little Jewish kids love eating gelt. You know what gelt is, right? Chocolate coins. You go to your stop and shop wherever you see gelt everywhere. I mean, it's all over the place there. And so they'll play, and if they win, they'll get some of the chocolate gelt and so on and so forth. And because it's related to oil, they pig out on jelly donuts. Or frying latkes, potato pancakes, or latkes. Because it's all associated with oil. The one day supply of oil that was found in the temple that miraculously burned for eight days. The 
miracle of Hanukkah. Neskado Haya Po, a great miracle happened here in the land of Israel. And just because Jesus said, I am the light of the world, he calls you and I to be the same light, right? Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He's the light of the world. He has called us to be a light to the world as well. How do we become a light to the world? By displaying who Jesus Christ is. Amen. Not just on Christmas. 365 days a year. Amen. We are to be a light to the world. A great miracle happened in your life. A great miracle happened in my life. And what was that great miracle? The light of the world came into our lives. Amen. The light of the world came into my life. If it wasn't for that guy over there sitting down there. The light of the world came into my life, April 22nd, 1988, 10.49 a.m. on a Thursday morning, working with this guy over here who would not shut up. <laughs> we worked at an animal shelter in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and I tried to get this guy fired, I don't know how many times. I mean, I'd sit down with our boss, I'm like, can you please tell this guy to stop preaching to me? Send him somewhere else, I'm tired of training this guy. All he talks about is Jesus, 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 Jesus. But you know something? The Holy Spirit of God broke through, man. And him and I sat down at lunch. And I bawled that day, man. And I bowed my head and I trusted in Jesus Christ as my personal savior. The light of the world 35 years ago came into my life and performed a miracle. If you would have told me 40 years ago, hey, you know, August, you'd be traveling around the world, you'd be writing books and talking about Jesus to return. I would have laughed at you. No way, man. I love my life. I'm perfect just the way that I am. Boy, was I deceived. <laughs> Lying to myself, man. The biggest deception out there today is self-deception, and that was me. And then God brought this guy into my life, Brother Chris Barrow, and he led me to the Lord. April 22nd, 1988, 10.35 a.m. on a Thursday morning. It was absolutely, I still remember it like it was, like it was just yesterday. Amen. The light of the world. Folks, in closing, we should be that same light. Amen. Why? Because I believe soon and very soon we're going to see the Savior. I believe soon and very soon we're going to see Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about the sound of a trumpet. And when that trumpet sounds, it will be so loud, all the born-again dead in Christ will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain, caught together with them in the clouds, meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore we are told to comfort. Comfort one another with these words. The next main event on God's calendar of activities we call the rapture of the church. That's recorded in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And what did Paul say through all his Pauline epistles? Don't be ignorant, he said. He said, I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren. I think he's talking to us. Concerning them which are asleep. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even as also them which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. I love that word caught up. It's a Greek word, haparzo, meaning to harpoon, reel it in. The Latin is raptoro, the first person, plural, future, indicative, passive tense, to seize or to snatch away. That could be today. Could be today. We don't know the day and the hour, but it could be at any moment, at any time. And when that trumpet sounds, we're gonna rise to meet him in the air. Hold on to your seat. Can you imagine if I really blew this and rapture did happen? Wow! I'm like, sorry about that, Michael. Come 
up hither. Revelation 4, 1 and 2. And faster than you can blink a human eye, bye-bye. We are out of here. And we're going to receive a glorified body. I ain't going to deal with this body anymore. I ain't going to deal with sin anymore. Glorified body. Whisk us off into the heavenlies faster than we can blink a human eye. So Hanukkah should remind us. Actually, it's day four. Is that going on me? There we go. Tonight will be day four of Hanukkah. Four more nights to go. Let Hanukkah remind you and I, and Christmas for that matter, that just as Jesus was the light of the world, let us be that same light. Amen. Every head bowed and back raised. With every head bowed, every eye closed, we'll be dismissed in a few minutes. If you're sitting here this morning at Bellingham Bible Baptist Church and you're saying, August, I do not have the assurance of going to heaven when I die. I don't think I'm ready. If I was to die right now, August, I think I'd split hell wide open. Well, if the real show, Father, the real trumpet was to sound right now, I might be the only person left at Bellingham Bible Baptist Church, left behind while everyone else is gone. I want to be ready, August. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me this morning? I want to be ready. I want to be saved. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you just slip your hand up and put it down so I can pray for you? Do we have anyone like that here? I see that hand. I saw that hand. God bless you. I saw that hand. Would there be another hand here? This morning, August prayed for that hand to be saved. That's the carrier. Pray for you. Pray for that hand to be saved. We want to sit down and talk with you. I'll show you from the Bible how you can know for sure without a shadow of a doubt. the invitation open for a few more minutes and I want to ask you all many of us raised our hand in, in salvation but many of us also and I do this every time have family that is not saved that is not saved I want you to pray for them now I want you to come down to the altar and pray for a family member that's not saved and if you're not sure and you didn't raise your hand about salvation we just heard what was going to happen and it should it should give you comfort it should give you comfort when that rapture happens. It should, we shouldn't be afraid of that. We're just to watch and pray. But I do know that we all have family, we all have friends. Somebody we know is not saved. Somebody we know needs our prayers now. Somebody we know could die and go to hell. And you might be the only opportunity they have. You might be the only opportunity they have to find Jesus. Strangers. We see strangers every day. People we don't know. People we've never met. People we might not ever see again. You have that opportunity. You are the light of this world. You, uh, you, you, uh, you have come. Jesus has come into your heart. Jesus has come into your heart to do his work. And we're not to stop until he comes back or we go home to be with him. We're, we're not to stop. 
We're not to stop to be, we're, we're not, we're not going to stop being a witness. We're not going to stop being a light. And when you find your, when you find your light dimming a little bit because you're getting caught up in this world, what do you need to do? You need to go back to the Bible. You need to go back to praying. Just leading somebody to Christ. I, I, my, my mother-in-law is here and she, she just give this testimony real quick. She broke her shoulder in Peru and she had to come back and spend some time with us to recover. We went out to Michigan for Thanksgiving and there was a visitor at my brother-in-law's church. He just got voted into a church out there and there was a visitor at his um, singing service and she was able to lead her to the Lord. And I say that to say this, that was a divine appointment. If she wasn't there, would somebody somebody may have led her to the Lord, somebody may have talked to her, but it took some time, it took dedication. Many of us, when we see somebody out there on the street, see somebody in the store, family member, are you willing to give that time and de dedication to witnessing to them, telling them about Jesus, showing them? See, many of us often say we don't have time, but the reality is we're watching and praying. We're supposed to be doing God's work, not our work not serving self, but serving him. And that's what it's going to take from this point forward is us serving him day in, day out, every hour, every minute, every second in order to reach the souls in this world, doing whatever we can. Don't be afraid to get on an airplane. Don't be afraid to get on an airplane. Go to a foreign field. Go see a missionary. Pass out, pass out scripture in another foreign language. Do whatever you can. Just because you don't speak their language does not mean you can't tell them about Jesus. You will be able to communicate. It, it doesn't matter. We, I, I go down to Peru every year. I don't speak Spanish at all. I'm practicing, learning. But there's a way. There's a way to communicate when you're talking about your Savior, Jesus Christ. Brother August, I want to thank you for that this morning. It was a blessing. And I know it was a blessing to my, my church here, as they, many of you know Brother August. And I hope to have him back again this coming year. We're at the end of 2023. I hope to have you back in 2024. We'll get that on the calendar. Um, but we're going to have some food now downstairs. I'm going to pray. I'll close in prayer. I'll pray for the food downstairs. Now, we had a big uh, uh, Christmas party last night. And always with this church, we have so much food. <laughs> And it's such a blessing, and I'm still recovering from what I ate last night. However, it's always better the second day. Uh, so we were able to keep much a lot of food last night. My wife and um, uh, sister Pauline's downstairs preparing that, making sure everything's ready to go. So just um, bl uh, pray for them, thank them as well. But we'll go downstairs, have some food, a little bit of fellowship, and then I want you to enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And uh, Lord willing, we'll see you back here on Wednesday for our prayer service at 6.30. Sister Nancy? There is. Sorry. I always forget. My wife will yell at me. Choir practice uh, after you eat. Um, have a bite to eat. And then there will be choir practice because you have to uh, practice the Christmas cantata. Um, but uh, I'm sure that will be a, a blessing as well. So choir after you eat. Just look for Alicia. She'll let you know uh, when, when to come on up. Uh, and do that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'll bless the food downstairs. Dear Father in heaven, Lord God, I'm so thankful for you, Lord, and what a blessing it is to be able to hear your word preached, hear about what's to come, Lord God. And I do pray, Lord, that everything in our hearts are settled today, that we won't leave here without something being settled. And I do pray, Lord, that everybody, everybody who gave testimony of salvation, maybe some didn't raise their hands, Lord God, but there's still time. They haven't left yet. And I do pray, Lord, that you work in their heart to come ask me, come ask Brother Rosado or anybody here how to find Jesus. I do, I do pray now, Lord, that you bless the food downstairs and the fellowship that we're going to have and, and the ladies uh, getting it prepared down there as well. Bless them. We're thankful today and always. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And don't forget to come look at the table uh, as well, the books and things that Brother Rosado has as well. But with that, God bless and enjoy the rest of your day.